Hearken ye, all among you who would listen to the roll of years as they have wrought their tale upon the misty Isle of Harm, of how it has come to pass that it is now the year 720 of the Tuzzin Reckoning. Good morning. If you're watching this at around the time I post it, then Happy New Year. I'm the Complex Games Apologist, and today's episode is going to be about the history of my favorite role-playing game setting, the Island of Harn, a fantasy world that I call the most medieval of campaign settings. And what I mean by that is that everything exists for a reason. It is low fantasy. There are things that don't exist here. There is magic. There are monsters. But everything happens for a reason, and everything exists for a reason. Now here's the contrast. Harnik history is all about interlocking. It's all about how something was either bound to happen, or how it unexpectedly reacted to something new. And that there's this continuum of events. They go together. In contrast, I see the history of a number of fantasy settings, especially, as just a list as something where they can slide. There's nothing special about the where and the when and the why, so much as it's just a list of things that need to be there. But when you want a more serious campaign and where you want to tell more human stories, like the ones we see perhaps in A Song of Ice and Fire, I say go to something which follows the same rules as the world that we live in. Now, I debated a lot with myself about whether to work backwards from the present, because there's only one year that is the present in Harn, 720 Tuzzin Reckoning, or to work forwards from the very beginning, the mythic beginning. And I decided, after a long debate with myself, that the answer would be both. We're going to describe how it is that the seven kingdoms in the three regions of Harn, the north, where there's Orbal, the south, and the east, where there's Kaldor, Shabisa, and Meldorin, and the wild west, where there's the three kingdoms in the remains of the Korani Empire, Kande, Rethem, and Tharda. And we will explain how each of those three states have arisen and survived, and we'll work backwards to do that. And where we need to explain the people, and where we need to come up with why there are these fantastic elements, like, say, elves and orcs, we will work forwards. So let's begin by examining a microcosm, the tiny kingdom of Shabisa. Sitting atop the Ganeen Trail that knits Meldorin, the arbiter of trade between Harn and the mainland, with Kaldor, this huge watershed and this huge market, and Shabisa is able to collect some tolls on those caravans, and it enriches them. So even though they have only three keeps, they're doing pretty well for themselves. And in addition to that, they sit right next to the Hodiri, the most renowned horse breeders in Harn. And of course, knighthood is a really big deal in Harn, which means that they're also able to take a little bit off the top right there. Now there's fertile soil, and there's also the prospect that maybe one day they could dig a port up the Olmerian River in its tidal estuary that might allow them to cut out the Meldorini monopoly on trade. They might need a partner to uh, enforce that claim and someone with a navy, but anything's possible in the future. But how is it that they are still independent? Why is it that either of these kingdoms who has a flower of knighthood, hundreds of bannermen that they could call upon, well, why isn't it that they haven't knocked down their door? Well, for one, because there are barbarians in between, the Beguilin are one of the most savage. The answer, of course, is that Shabisa hasn't always been independent. It has lost its crown several times. The most recent was during the Treasure War. King Terastra, a warmonger and a war lover, saw an opportunity when a treasure sword was missing from his vault, possibly a magic sword. He accused the Shabisans of harboring the thief and of having that treasure sword in the basement of Burzine Keep, an incredibly stout fortification designed by a dwarven architect. And for three years, King Balasir of Shabisa withstood the assault of the Kaldoric Knights. Dispossessed of all the other functioning land in his kingdom, however, he had to take the honors of war. He had to go into exile with only a few of his retainers and live in obscurity in Meldorin. And during almost 10 years of exile, Kaldor ruled Shabisa. Now, King Terastra passed in that interval, 
And in the meantime, so did the king of Melderin. And the new king of Melderin said, Oh, all right, I, I guess you can go around begging for help from my earls and my barons, and you can owe me favors, and you can owe them favors, and possibly money, and if you get enough bannermen together to kick Kaldor out, then you can go do it. Of course, you'll be one of my earls. You'll be part of my kingdom when you do it. And that's exactly what he did. Balsir reclaimed Burzine Keep. Because Terrestra, in his military competence, was not there to stop him. And when he arrived, he reneged on his promise to the Meldorini kings. That was in 687. It's 720. And Meldorin did not call him on that betrayal. Now, it could be because they would rather just leave Shabisa to be in this kind of state of limbo. And it's true that since then, the kings of Shabisa have been incredibly anxious that either Kaldor or Meldorin might knock down their door. So that is why Shabisa exists now, because it's almost a hot potato between these much larger and more powerful kingdoms of Harn. And that's part of how this tapestry of Harnic history weaves together. If you'd like to understand more, let's continue. So before we launch into our next topic, let's take one of those CGA moments where we say, what do I care, and how does this prove the main point? Shabisa's history between Meldrin and Kaldor, its role as a hot potato in recent times, tells us and gives us an example of what its future might look like, so you as the game master can conjecture pretty readily about what the tensions, the central tensions, around the kingdom are. Now, why do I care? Well, because Shabisa is a tiny kingdom, and there's every prospect that the players may end up being minor nobles, retainers to one of those minor nobles, or even in a position to be able to seize the throne for themselves. So, this is one of those places where the right sizing of Harn and the right sizing of this particular kingdom that's almost ready to be an adventurer, conqueror, king story, well, that's why I care. Let's look backwards into time and start at the very beginning to answer the linguistic riddle of how it is that Harn has a single language among all of its different kingdoms. Of course, barbarians speak their own tongues, which are often nonsense to the civilized people. But among the settled peoples of Harn, they speak Harnic. Now, a lot of this has to do with a long, long time ago when a people called the Gerund happened upon this uninhabited island where it was an unspoiled treasure of natural beauty. But lo, they found the elves there. And from them, they started learning things like agriculture and tool making and writing. And this was really good for them. They started building towns. Harn became a cradle of civilization because of this learning. Sort of ancient alien style way of bootstrapping yourself from hominid origins. This was going great until some sort of cataclysm happened on the interior of the Lithian continent, sending waves of barbarian invasions. These were called the Atani Wars, and these new people were not nearly as friendly to the elves and the dwarves and didn't want to live in harmony with the natural landscape. The elves and the dwarves had set up something called the Code Minium, with King Dalda of the Elves administering these younger people. And this Code Minium met the barbarian forces at the Battle of Sorrows, around 680 negative TR. And it was a Pyrrhic victory. It shattered the confidence of the elves, and they withdrew to their kingdom of the Shaba Forest. They renounced the Code Minium, and this did not go over well with the dwarves. And it was here that elves and humans parted ways. A lot of that mystique from that learning was lost. But the language remained. The Ferric people had great use of it, even as they lorded over the Gerund. And from that, the nobles of the new kingdoms, while they needed to intermarry, and also their second sons and daughters would become priests and administrators and so on. And so records and heralds and priests and sermons and everything remained in the singular language that made things gel. Not the barbarians of Harn and the certain new arrivals like the Hodiri that are a linguistic isolate, well, they don't necessarily speak the same thing. But elsewhere, there's one Harnic tongue. This is what gives a lot of identity to this continent. This is why people everywhere 
are participating in trade. There are caravans which are sojourning across the vast wildernesses from Kaldor into the north or along the Ganin Trail from Meldoran into Kaldor and then along the Trowbridge Way or Trollant from Kaldor to the Thardic Republic in the west. And would this be possible without this common foundation? And that's an interesting point. And while it has been a number of years since then, the Church of Elvir and the common pilgrimage site at Araka Kalai certainly had a lot to do with it. And the new faiths of Lorani and Paoni have dismantled a lot of Elvir's dominance, and it could be that there could be some linguistic drift now, as religion and learning and intermarriage between the nobles of the kingdoms could all wane. The kingdoms are now big enough that intermarriage between the nobles isn't strictly necessary. And Harn could be going into a period where there will be new languages. But for now, Harn is ready to play. It's certainly an expedient to have a common tongue in your campaign setting. But it's often one which runs perpendicular to the ideas of believability and a lot of those details are seen to with the origins of Harn, which are also very interesting ones, which give you a few adventure seeds just in the tale that I've just told. If you want to know more about Harnic history, I encourage you to begin your own studies. I will be making more videos on this continent, so go ahead and subscribe and hit the like button and share this around if you think Harn is a great place to play tabletop role-playing games with a more mature and adult air. I'm the Complex Games Apologist, and I make videos like this every week or so, 